This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 356 of the Yellow World Pod. I'm your host Stefan Butzko and today we will talk about Borussia Dortmund's 1-0 draw to last place Mainz and we will preview Tuesday's match against third place Bayer Leverkusen. For all that and more joins me Matthias Uck. Hello Matthias, how are you doing? Well, my mood is about as gloomy as the weather today in Colorado, <laughs> so I'm great Stefan. How are you? Yeah, yeah. You see... On Sunday morning, uh, for the first time this year, I played soccer with a friend and uh, just after sitting down for a little bit and m not moving and then getting up again, I feel really sore all of a sudden. So um, yeah, the uh, weekend result obviously did not help, but um, we have a special guest tonight. Uh, he is the author of Mensch Beyond the Cones and he reports about German football, among other things, for Deutsche Welle. Welcome to the show, Jonathan Harding. Hi guys, thanks for having me on. It's, it's Lovely intro. To, it's, it's, it's great <laughs> to have an uh, Englishman on during the English Woche. I feel like that's fitting. Um, Jonathan, <laughs> Very nice. you, you Very had nice. the privilege of being in the stadium and freezing your butt off personally. <laughs> so uh, I, th I think uh, that means you have also the privilege of uh, just uh, spouting your top line reactions to that one all draw. Yeah, I mean, it was cold. That's true. Um, I feel like many games for Dortmund this season have been a tale of two halves and this was no different. In the first half, they were very good. Uh, they probably should have been three or four nil up. But as seems to be customary for Dortmund, they weren't. Um, and in the second half, I thought their plan fell apart a bit. I would have liked them to be a bit more patient. I thought Terzic panicked a little bit. Um, I feel like they probably would have won the game if they'd have just kept doing what they'd done in the first half. But yeah, I mean, I guess you start to feel that things are going against you when Levenut Stanali scores the goal of his career. <laughs> um, I, I, I think Dortmund just needed to be a little bit cooler, you know, keep their heads. And I think this game was the kind of game they would have won. I, I did ask Edin Terzic afterwards whether he thought it would have been the game, the kind of game they would have won if there had been fans. And he was very quick to say... Uh, it's very hypothetical. You know, we have to win without fans. We've won without fans before. We have to do it again. Of course, we missed them. And I, I felt like, of course, he acknowledged that. But I did feel like there was something in his voice that was very resigned to the fact that this was the reality. And, you know, there was no time to consider if, buts or babies. And I couldn't help but think being in that stadium that Dortmund would have won this game had the zoo been full. And, you know, you, you had that audible amount of momentum. Um It just felt like something was missing there for Dortmund when they really needed it. Uh, Marco Royce wasn't good. Uh, I think there's some bigger questions about the longevity of Marco Royce's role in this team, especially given the number of players in that position. And I think if Erling Haaland doesn't score, Borussia Dortmund really struggle, and that's a big problem. So I think there are a lot of things to take away from the game, but ultimately the bottom line is this can't draw with Mainz. Yeah, it's... Uh a way of Dortmund to turn a must-win into a should-have-won, you know, because uh, if you look at, you know, most of the parameters being expected goals or whatnot, uh, and, and frankly, just at the chances they had, Dortmund should have won the game. I think the expected goals, according to Statsbomb slash FBref, was 2.4, whereas mine's is 0 0.8. Obviously, other sides have different models. Um, but, Matthias, before... We uh, join in uh, Jonathan's canon uh, about everything that was doom and gloom. Uh, I actually thought, uh, in comparison to other games against lower to bottom, uh, uh, yeah, against bottom teams, this was actually a, I guess, good performance if you compare it to what Dortmund showed against Cologne, Augsburg, etc. So especially in the first half, I thought they were very tense. They were uh, uh, pr pretty in their groove. Uh, how did you see it? 
Well, I mean, obviously I echo everything Jonathan said uh, over the entire 90 minutes, but I echo also what you say about the first 45 minutes. It was brilliant. Honestly, I was I was shocked. And that's that's already an indictment there, isn't it? I was shocked <laughs> by how well Dortmund played in the first half against this type of an opponent. Um, they played with intensity, a lot of pace. It was fast. There was a lot of off-the-ball movement. They played with the right amount of width in the right time. I mean, uh, if you just look at the offside goal, which was offside, more marginal than I actually thought. I thought it was more clear, but when then when you drew the magic line, I'm like, oh, it's that was pretty close. Um, that that really encapsulated all that. It was fast. They spread uh, and stretched uh, minds out, put in a great cross. I mean, the one thing about Meunier, who obviously is much maligned for many good reasons, even though I thought he actually had a pretty good match uh, during this one. Um, his crosses are whipped in with quite a good amount of pace on it. And that makes it very difficult for defenders to deal with at times. And um, I thought uh, that that worked well. Um, and they should have, you know, I mean, you can't account for certain things. You know, you can't account for the fact that Robin Sentner probably had the match of his life. I mean, that that was some of the saves he was pulling off were Manuel Noya-esque. It was absolutely breathtaking for him. It's great for him, but, you know, I'm not a, a mind supporter. Uh, so it was it was really frustrating to watch in that sense. And uh, but overall that when I watched it, I'm like, OK, Sentinel's not going to play like that the whole match. You know, don't wonder they're going to catch him. They're going to score a goal. And and really, the the equalizer was kind of that one. They minds could have defended that better. Um, but it just, I didn't expect the second half to quite play out like it did based on what we saw in the first half. Um, we've said that before about Dortmund, but usually in the reverse context <laughs> that the first half was kind of nah, ho-hum. And then the second half, they turned it on. Uh, this one was completely opposite. And aside from possibly fatigue playing in, I can't really explain it, uh, even though uh, I do believe Edin Tezic made a very large tactical mistake in the second half. Okay, we can actually talk about it right away if you want. I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the first half and the intense pressing, but uh, since mm -hmm. you mentioned the tactical mistake, I think uh, the one guy who had his finger on it at the post-game conference already was uh, one Jonathan Harding, because I think he asked... Uh, Mr. Tezic, why did you take off your best man, Jude Bellingham, in midfield? And uh, the answer from Mr. Tezic was that he, uh, with the introduction of Mokoko, wanted to uh, get Harlan more in the game to uh, sort of, uh, you know, maybe divert attention from Haaland uh, as, as the Mainz defenders. But as I just looked it up, um, Erling Haaland had seven touches in the second half and none after the 78th minute. So, um, Jonathan, since you were such a keen observer and had an even better view than we at home on the television, uh, why was it such a tactical mistake as uh, Matthias correctly highlighted? Well, because he was their best player. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I think one of the issues was but that Why Dortmund, was he the best player? Because he was a connecting piece. Um, you know, so often Dortmund are relying on, on Mats almost to play those vertical passes, which I think he's probably the best in the Bundesliga at doing. But you can't ask Hummels to do that uh, for 40 minutes, uh, I don't think, um, because there's going to be an element of risk in that and you will lose possession. And Mainz, for all of their faults, you know, are still the Bundesliga side capable of posing problems on the break, as was evident. And I just thought Bellingham was the, the kind of player, you know, you look at Dortmund's midfield and, and I think they have been much maligned this season with, you know, for justifiable reasons. Um, Axel Witzel was very slow in possession. And when you look at the transformation to Dortmund last week in Leipzig when Emre Chan came on, uh, it, it shows that a midfield pairing that is willing to move the ball quickly but also make a lot of runs forward can make an enormous difference to the dynamism of this team and I thought with Chan playing the slightly more aggressive role next to him Bellingham was this perfect box-to-box -box midfielder he should have had two goals in the first half but he was covering the edge of the box he was running full-length sprints even if he wasn't getting the ball and I, one thing I really like about him is he always calls for the ball 
he's not shying away from the situation or the game. He always wants it. And I just thought it was really baffling to take off the player that was connecting your midfield group with your strikers to put on another striker because all that ended up happening was that Dortmund had basically a front four and Emre Chan sitting behind them in midfield and then Hummels behind him and the rest of the back four. And it just felt a bit like you're basically relying on Emre Chan to create or Mats Hummels to create everything here. And that played into Mainz's hands because four strikers, you know, it's all well and good having Sancho, Royce, Haaland, Mukoku up there, or even Brandt as well. I, I was just, who's going to give them the ball? You know, they're all waiting for the ball. They're all waiting for an, an opportunity. But you take out an element of creativity there. You know, and Terzic was very matter of fact. He just said, you know, it was a tactical decision, nothing to do with Jude's performance. We were happy with him. Well, if you were happy with him, why'd you take him off? You know, I don't understand that at all. And, you know, ultimately, we don't have this conversation if Roy scores the penalty, maybe, but... <laughs> no, we won't. I, I think it, it still stands to reason that, you know, <laughs> Dortmund's midfield is in desperate need of a box-to-box -box player. Yeah, and, someone and like the Bellingham, Hulk, maybe even. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in Bellingham, they have that. I mean, it's unbelievable to speak about that because he's 17 and I've been a very keen advocate of, you know, taking time in assessing him. And it's still very early in his career. But he's the most dynamic player of all Dortmund's midfielders. And that was obvious uh, on Saturday. Yeah, what is interesting, obviously, is that, uh, I mean, Bellingham's form has been up there high and he had already had a couple of lows. But, uh, you know, it's it, it, it really is hard to, you know, take him out of a match when uh, he is connecting this way. Now, I can obviously understand the uh, standpoint that uh, Tessic was getting from because even with Bellingham on the field, Dortmund did struggle to find Haaland. Uh, obviously, they did not improve that situation afterwards, but uh, I don't really think that uh, Haaland was really at the end of another chance after the offside goal he scored. And uh, that's, I guess, full credit to Mainz, but something that Dortmund needs to do better because if you have the... Uh, arguably second best striker in the world on the football field and someone who can really decide the game I think you need to find him uh, way more often even even in tight spaces but uh, the fact that he hardly even received the ball um, was a very difficult now obviously that opened up uh, other situations for other players Dortmund still had plenty of chances to uh, go ahead Marco Royce in the first half Bellingham as you already mentioned um, so yeah for Dortmund that's obviously maximum frustration um, Matthias Jonathan already talked about uh, the uh, build-up uh, responsibility falling to Hummels and John. You told me you, you had a stat for that? Yeah, you know, I was looking through match and player stats in preparation for this and, and trying to explain if there was a statistical explanation for what the problem was. Uh, overall, team stats, there wasn't. Don't dominate it completely. Uh, but then when you de delve a little bit deeper, the two things that kind of stuck out to me was one, Dortmund crossed the ball more than, than uh, Mainz did, which is a little shocking when you're dealing with a three-man defense. Well, it, was more necessarily... a, it, it was a 5-3-2, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I would say 3-5-2, well, I, I don't know. But either way, I yeah, think... Yeah, but you still had three. It, it, was, com it was too compact that, that yeah, I believe Mainz crossing was... but Mainz did close to middle, so it kind of makes sense that, that it would look like that. But... Yeah, I mean, if you look at the overall positions after putting in a thousand strikers, <laughs> Dortmund were just in the middle. There was the only width came from fullbacks and Guerrero. Um, I don't even know if you could pay him to put in a cross. Uh, he played one cross in the entire match. But the other one that was interesting was long balls. Uh, Dortmund tried a ton of long balls, way more than Mainz. And the two standouts were Hummels with 22, 21 of which got to their intended target, which is kind of insane. Uh, and Emre Can attempted 16 long balls. All 16 got to their intended target. Again, a little bit insane, uh, that conversion rate. Uh, and Chan was also the only one who attempted any through balls. The next closest one with long balls was Akanji with either four or six. I can't remember, but it's significantly less. And no Mainz player tried that many long balls. Um, so... That that shows a bit of frustration. On top of that, kind of echoing what you said as far as not getting it to um, to Holland, Mainz, 11% of their shots were within the six-yard box. How many would you guess 
percentage of Dortmund shots were taken within the six yard box? Within the six yard box, I don't know. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't remember even one. Maybe maybe a corner. It, none, not a single one. None. Uh, and they had twice as many long shots versus Mainz than versus Leipzig, which isn't entirely unexpected if you're going to play against a team that starts parking the bus a little bit more, a little bit more. You tend to take some frustration long shots. Um, but those for me are really interesting because it means there's a lack of an idea. And when the very baffling uh, <laughs> tactical switch happened, I, I remember turning to my son And going, oh, okay, so he's bringing in Mukoko. Mukoko is going to play in the 10 off of uh, Holland because of also his speed and creativity. And Brand's going to be in the double pivot with Chan because then you have that creative ball out of the out of the midfield, which Bellingham does sometimes lack. Brand definitely has, and some of his best performances have been in exactly that position. And then they started playing, and I look at it, and I'm like, that's a four one one four, you know, Royce behind. You know, uh, two strikers, and then you had with Sancho and Brandt two guys tucking in. And I think that's when I tweeted, you know, putting more bodies in a certain space does not magically, or in a certain area, does not magically create more space. In fact, it actually produces the exact opposite. It creates less space. And that was the biggest problem. There was just nothing there. There was no room to do anything. And all you had was Chan and Hummels coming from deep positions, trying to play a long ball into a defense that's sitting deep. And the only wit that was coming was the constant play over to Meunier. And if you're relying on Meunier to stretch the defense, you've got some issues. <laughs> uh, even though, again, he had a good match. Um, and you have to, you know, we call out enough the bad matches, but he had a pretty good match. And those were all the things. And, and I just thought Tezic, as good as he Let's say as much as he got right against Leipzig and as much as he got right in the first half against Mainz, he got it completely wrong in the second half. I mean, utterly wrong. That was the exact wrong thing to do. I mean, if you want to say we want to be more creative up front, bring in Mukoko, fine, I don't have an issue with that. I don't even have an issue with it if you take Bellingham off, per se. But then, to me, the logical choice would be to put Brandt in a double pivot with Chan so you have more creative buildup from a deeper position. But they just didn't do that. Instead, they just crammed more people into an already crammed space. Yeah, very true. I mean, the uh, the overall issue is obviously that uh, Dortmund could not replicate replicate the very intense pressing and very high pressing against Mainz, uh, which they showed in the first half and really suffocated Mainz, I think. And that obviously led to a couple of counterattacks. And then uh, on the counterattack, the defending, especially by Mr. Hummels, wasn't especially great. I mean, Hummels lunged forward a couple of times and you would expect that because that's just his style, but he was just caught out of position. And I think for the Otsnali goal, he just also looked rather silly. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think it was 28 yards or something. So it was kind of a wonder goal and people have been discussing whether Birke can do better there or not. Um, I, I don't really have an opinion there. I mean, I think he cut his hand slightly to it, but it was also just a very well-placed strike. Um, but um, overall, I think it afforded Mainz a little bit more opportunities in the end, especially when, uh, you know, Dortmund gave up position in, in the build-up when uh, you sort of cross it horizontally across the field and instead of finding a teammate that gets intercepted these situations are always very dangerous and I think uh, Jane Sancho had a couple of situations where he you know where his passes got intercepted like that um, that is almost to be expected and I, I think given how well Mainz have uh, played in recent uh, games especially on the counter attack uh, I actually expected a little bit more danger I mean uh, I think Dani Latza hit the woodwork once with the so there, there was, you know, a little bit of slapstick in the end by Dortmund too. But um, Jonathan, now I feel like we ha we have a couple trends here to discuss because on the one hand, looking at how Dortmund came right out of the gate in the first half is a massive improvement over much we have seen from Dortmund so far this season. But on the other hand, I think Tessic maligned it himself in the post-game presser that Dortmund were in the second half too hectic, too impatient, forcing too many through balls, not enough switch of play. Um, so what, what, what do you make of these sort of, uh, uh, yeah, opposed trends, let's put it this way. I think it says a lot about the team. 
I think uh, a team that isn't able to be patient against the worst team in the Bundesliga at home is a team on edge. Uh, a team that is very aware of the situation that they're in. I thought it was interesting in the context of the weekend when basically everybody around Bayern was unable to take advantage of a situation that would have made things much closer at the top. That Bayern ended up showing everybody how to do it. Um, and I think Borussia Dortmund really need to take a look at themselves. I mean, this is the kind of game that you need to win 2-1 and nobody ever talks about it again. Yeah, like Bayern did and when Niels Peterson yeah, hits exactly. the crossbar late. <laughs> exactly, yeah, but it's the kind of fortune that you can sort of say is on your side. I mean, it's not the kind of fortune that we would have talked about in the past, you know, of Bayern having everything going their way, but they really had to dig deep to win that game. And there were 17 minutes after Mounier scored for Dortmund to grab a winner. And obviously, you know, Michael Royce misses a penalty. But... I didn't feel, you know, Matthias was talking about it there for a second. I didn't feel this great sense of urgency in the final, after that, in the final 15 minutes. It was just hopeful cross after hopeful cross or long pass into the center, hoping someone would flick it on. And maybe Dortmund's biggest problem at the moment is that they're not scoring that early goal. And I, I honestly think if Erling Haaland's goal stands, they win this game 4-0. Um, and I think at the moment they are a side that relies heavily on the confidence of that, you know, steady footing in the first 10, 15 minutes if they can get that goal. But they need to address the fact that not every game is going to go that way. And what are you going to do if it doesn't? Because you can't, you can't keep drawing these games if, if your ambition is to, to do more at the top than just finish second. And I think going forward, that's something that Terzic has to address. He obviously is capable of getting the team playing in a desirable way in the opening half an hour. But the team has to be able to consistently perform over 90 minutes. You know, that's how long these games are. And even if there are passages in the game that are not going your way, that's going to happen. You have to rely on a, a good save here or you know, a smart piece of defending there. You have to do your best to get through those passages And then you have to win. And there, is, there are more than enough quality players in attack for Dortmund to do that. And I think that's what's most frustrating. Uh, he's got to get that right and that will be his biggest challenge. But I just felt very frustrated watching the last 15 minutes of this game because as you've both mentioned already, there wasn't a plan. And I don't think you can afford to approach these games in that manner. You know, if you, if you sit down at half time or even after the goal, You, you know, you rely on your leaders in that situation, your Royce, your Hummels, your Chan to say, right, guys, we have dominated this team. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. We will be rewarded. We will get a chance. And the moment that you get your first chance and you take it, right, let's just keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And I, I would have liked to have seen a bit more intensity. And that's why, as I said earlier, I think that they probably would have been given that push had there been spectators there but you know the the world we live in at the moment is is not that it's echo chambers and and they've got to do better to find those those answers themselves you know, we've talked i'm sure you guys have talked about it a lot i find terzic being very active on the sideline very interesting because what does that tell me does that tell me that the team is so young that it needs those instructions because i think active coaching on the sidelines suggests that there's something missing there, that your team isn't capable of making those decisions itself. You know, we were talking about high performance athletes. The ideal way to approach things in, in, in this sense, I believe, is to have your players on the field make those decisions. You know, I, I, I question how effective it is to consistently say, fight for that ball, communicate, push here. You know, I, I wonder whether teams need that. And if they do, why do they need that? And maybe that's something that this Dortmund team needs because it's young. But I feel like we've been saying that Dortmund that team is young though. for 10 right. years. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I think Dortmund have, have got to get over these kind of performances. Um, they can happen during a season, but I think not, not in the way that it happened on Saturday. Yeah, not with that consistency. So yeah, my, my big issue is obviously that this was already an improvement in terms of performance uh, against this sort of opponent which is a big indictment, but uh, I, I agree. The uh, I, I actually think right now the micro-coaching does help 
because uh, I think it is needed. Uh, we have talked a lot about intrinsic motivation for this team and, uh, you know, lack of communication. I think before Testage was introduced, uh, Dortmund, when it comes to communication, probably one of the quietest teams on the field. Players don't really talk enough with each other, I would say. Um, that's obviously a, a, an issue in itself, which uh, you do not fix just, you know, by by a snap of your fingers because that sometimes also just comes down to the personalities you have on the field. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it really is a difficult um, game to, to digest because there are positives, but in the end you have this result. Um, Matthias... We have uh, obviously already talked about the adjustments that Tessic made and how they might have failed. Now we have a question from Bastian Himmelruder, uh, who wants to know whether it was smart to use one of the three substitution slots three minutes ahead of the break to switch uh, Akanji for the injured Zagadu. Couldn't have Dortmund bridge that gap by moving Chan further back. And do, I mean, I don't quite understand. I mean, then uh, as an alternative play with an injured Zagadu until the half? I mean, Yeah, no, just take Zagadu out and play down and play with, with 10, ten men. men. Yeah. No. You know, no. The the, the question no. almost think... feels a little bit absolutely obsolete and I'm sorry Bastian, but uh, in in the end Dortmund only made two substitutions <laughs> because Mokoko brought uh uh Tessic brought Mokoko on for Bellingham. But after that, there were no substitutions. Now, um, like I said, uh, let's talk a little bit about the adjustments that were not made. Um, if you're chasing the game and you can feel a drop off in energy and intensity, um, I mean, obviously Dortmund were down, uh, Torgen Hazard and Giorena, but I, I think you have at least Hanye on, on the bench and Stefan Tigges, even the Paslak. Uh, Matthias, there are some options on the bench to reinvigorate the game. Um, do you do you think Tessic should have done more or uh, in instead maybe maybe even less? <laughs> well, I think you can make an argument that the Mukoko Bellingham uh, tactical switch was a mistake, um, especially given how he switched up the formation in that context. You know, if he would have done what I thought he was doing was bringing Brandt back to play that true creative role and then things don't work well you have other options on the bench that you could maybe bring in and 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 plug in and, and play that way uh but he he kind of painted himself into a corner because you know uh as i always like to call him Reina, uh you, you know i don't really know what he would have added in that situation if you're going to take off royce who yes he made mistakes in the sense of, obviously, he missed the two biggest chances for Dortmund. Uh, but other than that, he was actually playing quite well, and, and he pressed well enough. Um, you could have maybe said, take take uh, Brandt off um, and put him in. There, there was just a lack of options. The only one that I would have looked at and said, you know, maybe, and that's Guerrero, because um, once again, he... This is, I think, the third match in a row where he led the team in being dispossessed. Um, and the, I think he's just tired. Um, there was also, I, I want to say, was it the goal? No. Well, one situation where he played a pass to Mukoko that he shouldn't have played because Mukoko was double covered. Mukoko got wrestled off the ball and Mainz had a quick counterattack. Yeah, was it the Niakate solo run? I don't, I can't remember if it was that one, but either way, Guerrero just stood in Mainz's penalty area and made no indication of even walking back. And if you are a defensive player, which he still is, and you go that far forward, you play a pass, you're running off of it, it doesn't come, you better haul your ass back into defense because you have now put your defensive teammates at a disadvantage numerically, and that's when mistakes happen. That's when Hummels thinks, oh, I got to step up. That's when Chan thinks, I got to go in a little bit harder. That's when whoever the partner is is caught between two minds of going, okay, do I stick or twist on which player? And Buki goes, oh, do I come out? Do I have to stay on my line? That's where that entire chain of thought 
gets really messed up defensively is when if you go forward as a defender, you have to track back really fast. And even though I had my criticisms of Hakimi as a defensive player in terms of his positioning wasn't great, his tackling wasn't great, but when he went forward and he got dispossessed, he ran back at full speed. And you see that at Inter as well. He hustles back. He doesn't just stay up front and go, oh, well, woe is me, it didn't happen. And Guerrero has always done that. And in a match like this, I just remember seeing that in his body language because on the replay, you could see him the whole time. And he just couldn't be bothered to go back because the move didn't come off because he played a pass he shouldn't have played. And that, to me, is a mistake. And that's where you say, hey, bring on Paslak, who is like, you know, the Energizer Bunny, because he just runs all game long. He will hustle back in that situation. Maybe that's exactly what Dalton needed then. But again, hindsight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 100%. I mean, uh, Rafa Guerrero has made the difference for Dortmund so many times. So obviously, there is always a reluctance to take off one of your best players, especially this season. Um, Jonathan, at the uh, outset, you uh, you were about to begin a sort of more general discussion about Marco Reus and the longevity. Do you want to uh, conclude your thoughts on that? Because uh, I'm very interested in, uh, in your thoughts on uh, Mr. Reus. Not only because he, he missed the penalty, uh, which he usually does not. I think he is a good penalty scorer and I don't really see a big need to change it. Obviously, you have Haaland there, but, um, you know, unfortunate, I guess. Got the nerves got to him, but uh, in in the more general way, what are your thoughts on him? And and maybe if you want to add to that, uh, what what do you make of uh, Julian Brandt's situation right now? Yeah, I don't. I agree. I don't think I would take Michael Royce off penalties just because of this miss. And I would also say that I haven't got these thoughts about Michael Royce because he missed a penalty. I I felt this way since the beginning of the season, um, and towards the back end of last season, I. I think his body isn't ready to keep going at this level, uh, personally. And I think he's probably going to have to make some tough decisions. If you look at almost every other member of Dortmund's attack, they're all players that I feel inevitably at some point won't be in this Dortmund team in the future. And you know, Marco Royce's career deserves to have been littered with more trophies absolutely no no question about that but I, I wonder whether he's going to have to ask himself some tough questions um, you know he's probably looking around that locker room and realizing that there are some very talented young players coming through uh, he's got to deliver better performances to stay in the team whereas I think a few years ago you could have argued not only was he playing better but you know he was Michael Royce, you know, the irreplaceable. I, you know, he's recently become a dad. Um, I, th I think that may well play a role uh, in his in his long term thinking, especially when you consider his his physical health. You know, the man has been through many injuries, and I think that takes a mental toll. You know, he's a guy who missed out on two tournaments with Germany. Probably should have been a World Cup winner. I think it's tough for him. And I think if he wants to win the Bundesliga, his window is rapidly disappearing. Because I think if, if Dortmund lose a couple of players this summer, uh, you know, they're going to have to start again. You know, I, I felt like this year or, or the year where they had the nine point lead was really a, a massive opportunity for him personally. Um, and I, I just wonder whether he's as irreplaceable as he used to be. And I mean, form is always a big conversation you know, I, I have a lot of time for Marco Royce I think he's a fantastic player I just would be very curious to to know how he feels about his body moving forward and to know how he feels about his mind you know he, it's not a question of finance it's a question of what he wants to achieve and he's got a lot of his life left to live after football you know does he want to live that with injuries that are going to affect him for the rest of his life uh, or, or does he does he want to look back on an illustrious career and say what a fantastic time yeah it could have been better but everybody could say that so I I'm curious I, I personally had a theory or you know, maybe it's just a feeling that this was Marco Royce's last dance this year this season and for, for, for him I would love for love to love to it to end 
uh, in similar way, fashion as to uh, Michael Jordan's with the Chicago Bulls. I don't know whether it will, but... Yeah, yeah, it could also be more of a thing like Stevie G, where he uh, is one of the <laughs> legends and stars, but the club only starts to win silverware once he retires. Could also be a scenario. It, I mean, you it, have to say, possible. you know, as great as Marco Royce is, you just mentioned the uh, nine-point lead that Dortmund squandered. I, I sometimes think that in, in that process of, you know, when when it came down to the wire, Marco Royce was always sort of at the heart of why Dortmund squandered. I mean, uh, I just think back to the, uh, you know, game against Schalke, for example, where Dortmund tragically lost and where Marco Royce and Marius Wolf <laughs> in, in very uh, quick mm. fashion got sent off, you know. But these are the games against the uh, already ailing Schalke team uh, where Dortmund need to win and Dortmund need their captain to perform. Instead, he hardly did anything good and then uh, got sent off because the frustration level got to him. You know, it's it's just a couple of windows in, into performances, but uh, also the one against Mainz, you know, get three points there and you're still five points behind Bayern and... Uh, season is long and you can see that Bayern are also you know ailing and struggling so you know these are maybe sometimes the, the the moments where the difference maker makes a difference by not making the difference if that makes sense so um you know yeah, Mark Royce sure. in, in, in some situations also just ha has himself to blame that uh, his own uh, you know uh, class did not live up to to the moments where he was uh, most needed so um you know, as as great as Marco Royce is, uh, sometimes uh, w when it was really crunch time, unlike Mar Michael Jordan, he uh, did not always show up. So this is something <laughs> I, I think we can hold up against him. But um, about you, Brandt, by the way, you you asked um, yes just just before I forget. I th I think he's also going through a bit of a crisis of confidence. Um, I think Matthias made a good point earlier about the position that he's best in. I would love to see him slightly more centrally. I think he's really fantastic in that role, but I th I think he's suffering from not being very consistent. I think it's fair to say that the move to Dortmund already hasn't worked out as he would have planned, <laughs> um, and and I th and I think that's a problem for his development. You know, when you consider how well he was playing at Leverkusen, and I think there is something to be said about the way that certain players play with other players or in certain places. You know, the Julian Brandt with Kai Havertz in Leverkusen is one of the best attacking midfielders around. and But the Julian Brandt in Dortmund looks a shadow of that. Now, I also think there's something interesting about his game that seems to have, have changed a little bit. I mean, I remember in, in 2018 when he got selected for Germany above Sané, I thought it was a great choice because he offers more. He's more diverse. He tracks back. But watching him on Saturday, he just drifted through most of the game. And I, I think that's got to be the most disappointing aspect for him. You know, he, I've had the privilege of speaking to him and I, he seems like a very relaxed man. He's, he's very calm. He, he seems to have his head screwed on in terms of what he does off the field. And I think sometimes it must be frustrating for him not to be in the game as much as he is, but I, I, I think he's got to do something about it because, you know, it's not just games that he's drifting through at the moment, but seasons. There's a lot of talk about his future and whether he should join another team. I mean, that's for him to decide whether he's the type of player that wants to go abroad. I think a lot of players probably second guess those kind of moves at the moment, given the pandemic. It's not a normal environment to, to move. But I... <laughs> I think if he's looking at it long term, you know, we're just talking about Marco Royce and his inability to perform at crunch time. I think if I was Julian Brandt, I'd be saying, well, this is my opportunity to step into that role and deliver. And I think if he can take that chance, then he cements his place in the starting 11. But if he doesn't, then I really worry about where his career goes from there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but uh, I, I discussed it uh, on, on previous shows that His assists and his goal contributions both have plummeted since making the move from Leverkusen to Dortmund, which is obviously bad news for Dortmund's recruitment department because obviously uh, these transfers always get announced with the player saying, I want to make the next step, but right now he has made one or two steps uh, backward and that's uh, very negative. Now, obviously, uh, to make the segue, Julian Brandt uh, may be uh, the 
benefactor of the curse of the X because he will face Bayer Leverkusen on Tuesday, which is already tomorrow. And uh, Matthias, I don't know if you want to rent again in a little while because Dortmund do play the Friday game against Gladbach uh, uh, right afterward, um, which uh, is the second time Dortmund have this kind of English Woche. Um, but yeah, Bayer Leverkusen are right now in third place uh, with 29 points. They have... Uh, Eight wins, five draws, and three losses, uh, and they have a better goal difference than Dortmund, hence they are ahead. They have a plus 14, with this Dortmund's plus 12. Their home record is uh, maybe not as good as their uh, away record. They have uh, 12 points at home, uh, away they have 17, but they've also played two more games on the road so far. Um, and obviously after 16 match days now, they have scored 30 goals, that's 1.88 per game, and they have conceded... 16, so one per game on average. And their best scorers are Lucas Alario with eight goals, Schick has five, and Bailey has four. Their assist leaders are Amiri with six, and Florian Wirtz with five. So, all that being said, Matthias, um, this is a game I look forward to. It's a game I dread because I know Bayer Leverkusen have the speed up front, which is the absolute undisputed poison for Borussia Dortmund this season because they do not have the speed at the back. But on the flip side, it's Peter Bosch. Bayer Leverkusen are also very susceptible to counterattacks and Dortmund do have this Erling Haaland fellow who could just bust through Bayer Leverkusen like a hot knife through butter. So this will be a very open game where the outcome is completely uh, unpredictable. So Matthias, what are we making of this? Ty, will Dortmund recover from the uh, drop of points and show that they can beat most of the teams that are in the upper half of the Bundesliga table? Well, um, like you said, I mean, the good thing is it's a Peter Bosch side. The bad thing is it's a Peter Bosch side. <laughs> and, um, you know, I still have this this nightmarish memory of the match that Dortmund threw away against Leverkusen. I mean, that's, that's the best way to, to say it. I, what, I want to say it was like Emre Can's first match and he scored that wonder goal, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, where, where one of the Bendas scored a goal off of the corner. I mean, it was just, yeah, that like it, it was Dortmund in a nutshell, brilliant. And then somehow loses because of stupidity um, I don't expect the stupidity because uh, I feel like uh, Dortmund's a bit more stable. Uh, plus, they have the experiences of Wolfsburg and um, Leipzig to go off of. And I think that's what really does play into Dortmund's hands here in the sense that Peter Bosch is not going to sit deep. He's not going to park the bus. He's not going to pack the 16-yard box with bodies to try to just shut down and grind out Dortmund and hit them on the break. He's going to play aggressive. They're going to press higher um, and leave space. And once you leave Dortmund's space, you will pay the price. That's just a fact. The, I have no doubt Dortmund will score at least one goal, um, if not two or three. The bigger question is, will you know, Leverkusen do the same thing? Um, this is one of those matches where you definitely need Akanji just because of his pace. Um, because beyond that, you're you're losing the pace. And this is also where we have to talk about Guerrero, who is a defensive liability, who is not a speed demon, and will be caught out of position. And then you will force a slow Mats Hummels to step up out of position. And you will get in situations that will cause goals against you. So um, I see this as a highly entertaining match. The neutrals are going to absolutely love it. And Leverkusen and Dortmund fans are absolutely going to hate it because it's just going to be, you know, oh, that's amazing. Ah, oh, crap. We conceded that goal. I, I just see that for 90 minutes. Um, so uh, it, it'll be fun, but also deeply frustrating. Um, it, it's, how should I say this? I feel more confident against Gladbach than I do against Leverkusen. Not just because, obviously, Dortmund's history with Gladbach in recent, I don't know how long. But uh, Leverkusen, it just... God, they're built to uh, concede the goals that Dortmund loves to score. But, God, I w they will most definitely score against Dortmund. It's just... This will be a who can outscore whom with the last kick. Yeah, very well said. I mean... Uh 
in the, the overall trend over the last years, especially since Peter Bosch joined Leverkusen, is obviously that Dortmund get outpossessed by Leverkusen and uh, Leverkusen usually really dominate the game and then Dortmund uh, sort of exploit Leverkusen's say naivete. I mean, if you go to who scored, one of the uh, biggest weaknesses that Bayer Leverkusen have is obviously uh, avoiding individual errors. So, Jonathan, maybe to put this back on the Leverkusen perspective, because I do remember when uh, Lucien Favre got sacked, that was also the same day Peter Bosch and Bayer Leverkusen went top of the table. Now, a couple of weeks later or a month later, um, they meet again and they are level on points and Bayer Leverkusen have a streak of four uh, winless games. They have three losses and one draw. So they obviously do not arrive... Uh, at the best capabilities they have. So, um, what kind of what kind of uh, situation is this Leverkusen side in, and what are their woes and worries that uh, they are not getting the results they arguably should be getting these days, considering the the squad they have. Oh, I think uh, you guys have talked about it earlier. I mean, it's a Peter Bosch side. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is the 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 makings of a of a three three draw. Um, I think both sides play high risk football. I think what I, I I wonder whether Dortmund can replicate the first half against Leipzig, the discipline, yeah. um, the 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 concentration, just to nullify an opponent that is looking to play that aggressively. Because I think Leverkusen, I feel like the kind of team, you know, they've they're the, we've said it a lot, but you know, they're the kind of team. I think the moment that publicly people sort of say, oh. Leverkusen you know then they go back to being the Leverkusen we're all familiar with but I, I feel at the same time there's probably it feels like this team isn't allowed to acknowledge the fact that they're trying to be contenders because I think if they do then they'll start to panic I have my concerns with the defense you know Lukas Rudetsky is, is a keeper that is good for some major errors um And I think Jonathan Tah is one of these players who have spent a long time waiting to deliver on potential and now I've just stopped expecting it to arrive. Um, it's just a bit disappointing that a player with that much experience hasn't taken the step on. Perfectly solid, but you know, for the number of games he's played and the experience he's had, you'd, you'd be expecting a lot more from him. Um, I think ironically, you know, they've become a team in a short period of time that is almost once again reliant on another playmaker you know without Florian Wirtz they look a different team with him they look much improved which is uh, you know hilarious because much the same as we were saying earlier with Bellingham it's important to take take things slow with young teenage talents and yet here he is doing his best to make sure that the hype just keeps getting ramped up weekend after weekend so I, I, I'm curious to see how they approach this game you know Peter Bosch has been very blunt about his assessment uh, of his sides recently you know their their draw recently I think it was against Bremen he was I'm glad there were no supporters here nobody was watching because that was terrible um, I think he feels frustrated that his side doesn't execute the way that he wants them to on a regular basis I do kind of sometimes wonder whether they miss Kevin Folland Um which is an odd thing to say because obviously Lucas Hilario has played reasonably well this season. Um, but I, sometimes I wonder about the way that this team plays. Hilario feels more like a an in-box striker, whereas Folland was the kind of guy who would run everywhere for you. But with Diaby and, and Wirtz, I, there's a lot of talent going forward in this team. And I I mean, not, that's to, why not to forget Schick and, and Bailey. I think the entire yeah, absolutely. Uh, Leon Bailey's is having pretty stacked. Yeah, Leon Bailey's having a good season, and I'm surprised that Leipzig let Patrick Schick go um, because Schick has been very good as well. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, it, it's almost it has the makings of a, of a game that both sides will expose how vulnerable their defenses can be. Um, which could be entertaining, but uh, it's probably not the way that either team wants it to go. I mean, we've seen it enough when Bosch was the head coach of Dortmund. He plays a high-risk strategy and Dortmund just needs to be smart. I really think that they should take the template that they had against Leipzig and, and use that to good effect because I think that Leverkusen are the kind of team that if you can blunt for a long enough period, then they get frustrated and Liam Bailey tries to score from 40 yards and you can start to 
deal with that and then pose your own questions on the break. Uh, again, though, you know, I honestly think it would be interesting to see how Dortmund assess this game if they score in the first 10 minutes. Because it's the kind of thing that can play absolutely into your cards if you do it, if you play it right. And the way that Dortmund have played at times this season, it makes me think if they score early, unlike Bayern, then they are in control. Um, but, you know, I especially mean, on, Dortmund. On what evidence? When has Dortmund scored early this season? <laughs> well, on Saturday, <laughs> when they scored early, uh, it, it felt great. Though. Yeah, no, obviously. But, you know, it felt great. And I thought, oh, here we go. You know, like you said earlier, the intensity that they were delivering was fantastic. And it felt like we were going to watch one of the best Bristol Dortmund performances in a while. Uh, yeah, follow, I, I, I got I got into the same exact mood like you. Uh, I, I expected the same because uh, looking at this intensity, I thought it was only a question of minutes for Dortmund to score against Mainz. Um, but uh, I 100% agree with you that I think the uh, Liverpool, uh, the Leipzig approach, especially the first half where uh, there was hardly any uh, action in front of the goals, is probably the, the smarter way for Dortmund to approach this. Now, um, obviously Dortmund will be without Axel Witzel, who uh, will be out for the season with the torn Achilles, and they will also be out uh, without Emre Can, who picked up his fifth booking. Uh, that arguably will mean that Thomas Delaney slots back in for him. And I would assume that uh, Jude Bellingham will get another run. Matthias, is there any other way you would uh, pick the double pivot that Dortmund are applying right now? Or will it be Delaney and Bellingham, uh, knowing that Delaney is obviously um, also in danger of a fifth booking? Well, you can play rotating central midfield booking game. You know, I mean, if Delaney gets a booking, which he odds are will, uh, he'll be out in the next match, but then Chan will be back. So, you know, you just play that game every so often. They just have to time it a little bit better so it's not quite so stacked on top of each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, based on the last few matches, given the intensity of pressing needed, uh, pressing resistance needed, I would also argue for Delaney Bellingham as the best choice because I don't know what's up with Dahoot. Um, and uh, given Brandt's uh, crisis of confidence, as Jonathan so uh, perfectly put it, I don't know if I would trust him in that position at this time. I think you'll get more solid play out of that combination of Bellingham and Delaney right now. Yeah, very true, though. I think that Julian Brandt will play uh, the same uh, position that he did against Manchester due to the lack of options. Giovanni Reyna is uh, maybe back. He trained individually today on Thursday. I don't know if it's going to be enough for him to make the squad or if it's going to be enough for him to uh, play from the bench, but I don't see him starting, to be honest. I think he had a little throat infection or something like that. Um, otherwise, obviously, Roy Sancho Haaland will be playing. And then uh, due to the lack of options as Zagadou is out with a, a muscle tear for two or three weeks, I think as Tessic said today, we will have uh, Akanji Hummels and then Guerrero and Meunier at the back. So um, without any further ado, I think we can knock it on the head here. It's also not uh, too many things to be said about this game. I think we'll have uh, plenty of talk after the game because this should be eventful as uh, all of all three of us have predicted. So Jonathan... Uh, Thank you, first of all, for coming on, especially on such a short notice, because uh, uh, I don't have my life together right now. And uh, my Monday morning is already your Monday afternoon. But nevertheless, uh, please tell our listeners how to follow you and please leave a prediction of a scoreline for this match. Thanks very much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Um, Seanblog66 on Twitter, if you're interested. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, it will be 3-3. Very well, Matthias. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Matthias Suk, and I am going to go to all, but either way, a draw. All right. I'm saying Dortmund are winning this three to two and uh, hoping for the best here, keeping my fingers crossed because uh, if Dortmund, say, beat Leverkusen and then Gladbach, it still would be an amazing January and the Mainz game would be nothing but a minor stumble. <laughs> Vexing, but still stumble. Anywho, um, if you want to follow all of us, please go to uh, Yellow Wall Pod on Twitter or Facebook. And if you want to read our written content, go to theyellowwall.net. If you want to sponsor an episode or contribute financially, go to our Patreon on patreon.com slash theyellowwall. And obviously, you can also 
subscribe to this podcast on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, etc. And uh, we shall be back on either Wednesday or Thursday ahead of the Friday night game against Gladbach. So as always, thank you for listening and good. <laughs>